Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Phillips. I'm president of Americans for Prosperity. Thank you for joining us for another of these series of Facebook Live events uh, where we talk with key leaders in the House and the Senate uh, as we battle what is just a horrific group of far left, uh, big spending, top down policies coming out of uh, Speaker Pelosi's house and uh, unfortunately from this administration as well. We've been battling those as an organization. So many of you have helped in this effort, sending emails and calls and texts to members, your members of the House and the Senate. Thank you for that. We're at a critical moment in this tax and spend bill that uh, some want to try to call it, and I'll use air quotes, uh, infrastructure bill. We know that's not accurate. It's basically this Christmas tree wish list of everything from the left. Uh, we're honored to have a, a member, a key member from the West Coast with us today to introduce him and to kick this off is Jocelyn Castillo from our Americans for Prosperity uh, Federal Affairs team. Take it away. Thank you, Tim, and we're so excited to have Congressman Ben Newhouse, a lifelong resident of Central Washington, serving and representing the 4th District. He's a third-generation farmer, and he brings a wealth of experience to Washington, D.C., and his ability to work across the aisle, deliver results for Washingtonians and Americans. And most of all, the congressman knows that looking out for taxpayers means Congress has to stay on budget and make the government work efficiently to fulfill its responsibilities. Thank you, Congressman, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be with both of you. Thank you, Congressman. To jump right in, we know that in the next few months, weeks, perhaps, you know, that process is getting started. I know things are moving quickly. Uh, DC is going to be making some pretty big decisions that are going to fundamentally potentially change the course of our nation uh, in, in negative ways. The spending spree and top-down proposals that we're seeing out of this administration uh, and, and out of this Congress are both unprecedented and, quite frankly, unsustainable. Just last month, I know that you and your colleagues joined in introducing a resolution to recognize that America's national debt is a threat to our national security. We're topping $28 trillion in national debt. Can you tell us why it is important that policymakers work to return to fiscal responsibility? What was the purpose behind this resolution and why do you see this as a national security threat? Well, Jocelyn, and thank you for shedding some light and focusing on this really important issue. Uh, uh, just listening to your question and hearing that number coming out of your mouth, $28 trillion, that's almost, uh, too much to even get your head around. That's, that's how much we as a country owe. And uh, frankly, if, if this administration, President Biden under his leadership, if he had at this, uh, at this point in if barely six months in, if, if he'd gotten everything he wanted, we'd be at uh, a total spending of $6 trillion in six months, that's just unprecedented, un unheard of. And it just continues down what I think is a very, very irresponsible path uh, for, for fe the federal government to be taking. We are, you know, this, this sounds very cliche and I apologize for that because you've all heard it. You've all said this uh, several times yourself. We truly are mortgaging our children, our grandchildren. I think we're into our great, great grandchildren by now but when we're talking $28 trillion. This has got to stop. We cannot continue doing this. It's unsustainable. We've got to get our fiscal house in order. Our effort to um, recognize the national debt as a threat to the nation, uh, to our national security is real. It truly is. Um, you know, right now we, we are in a period of low interest rates, right? Which uh, that, that has a whole nother, nother discussion. But because of that, the interest on our debt payments is, is not comparatively as large as it could be. But just wait, the interest rates always go up and down. They're due to go up. I anticipate that changing at some point. And then just the interest that we pay on that debt is going to be tremendous. It's going to be more than what we spend annually in our defense uh, appropriations. Uh, and, and what do we get for that? Nothing. We're just paying off debt. And then that's, that's truly uh, uh, putting our country at risk. I hate to use the term, but too big to fail. You, but you've heard that over the last couple of decades. People think, well, the United States, we're just too big to fail. Well, 
this kind of irresponsible spending continues, I'm not sure that's the case. We have to get our fiscal house in order and we have to do it very, very soon. Yeah, Congressman Newhouse, uh, we're seeing a very predictable result of all of this deficit spending and that's inflation taking off. We saw 5% inflation last month. The month before that, it was through the roof. This is the biggest inflation we've seen since the Great Recession of 2008. And if we continue down this path, we could return to a day that as a young kid, I remember my parents talking about, which was the, the Jimmy Carter era of just runaway inflation and slow growth in the late 1970s. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because these inflation numbers are really worrisome and they, and they hit people at the margins, you know, senior citizens on fixed incomes, that single mom with a couple of children trying to make it on a, you know, a tight salary or hourly wage. It, it's really worrisome. You know, you're absolutely right. And, and one of the ugly truths about what inflation is, that is a tax, literally, on everyone. It increases prices to everyone, regardless of your uh, income level, of where you live in this country. It's, uh, it, it touches everybody. You brought up President Carter and that administration. Well, I'm old enough to remember that, living through that. And our discussion about interest rates, we were pushing 20% interest rates, if you can believe that. Right now, you feel like, oh, gosh, if you pay 3 or 3.5% 3 on your house mortgage, you're paying too much. Imagine 18 19% and what that cost is going to do uh, and, and what that, that impact will be on our, the economic engine in the United States. It, it will truly throw cold water on any kind of recovery that we can we could hope to experience after coming out of the pandemic. So th these policies truly are dangerous for our future. We've got, like I said before, we've got to be more fiscally responsible. Congressman, to your point about how precarious the situation is from a national debt standpoint, we're seeing more trillions of dollars proposed uh, in, you know, by the recent administration in the form of a so-called infrastructure package. And I know that there's been debates, uh, particularly in the Twitter sphere, as to what infrastructure really means these days. Anything can be infrastructure. But you know, for those of us watching, would you walk us through uh, from where you sit, what is being proposed and what concerns you most and frankly should concern Washingtonians and American taxpayers uh, across the country? So, so Jocelyn, um, you're right. Uh, both of you have, have alluded to this. Calling this an infrastructure package is being playing very loose with the Eng English language. From, from my perspective, um, when we talk about infrastructure, traditional kinds of in infrastructure, roads and bridges, airports, even broadband uh, in today's modern age, those kinds of things that uh, truly do build the foundation upon which our economy is built. Uh, I think uh, looking at various uh, iterations, only about 6%, 6 to 8% of this package is, is true infrastructure. And the rest of the stuff is, I, um, I think is probably falls more under the under the category of a wish list of, of, of a liberal progressive uh, things that would be nice to have. We're talking about Green New Deal kinds of things. We're talking about, about expanding and really pushing uh, electric vehicles. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know, some things that aren't bad necessarily, but uh, don't really uh, fall under that category of infrastructure. And to, to sell it as an infrastructure pa package is not being truthful to the taxpayer. That They're gonna anticipate people in this country, rightfully so, would expect that, uh, that they're gonna see some true improvements to all of those things that allow uh, our, 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 our economy to, to really prosper and grow and truly build the foundation for our economy. And ju that's just not gonna happen if this goes through as is. So that, I, I think that that's uh, not being forthright with people. I think we need to be more truthful. And there again, <clears throat> the, the taxes that would have to be raised in order to uh, pass the, the package that this administration wants to bring forth is going to uh, truly 
uh, hinder our economic recovery. When you when you start raising taxes, people think, oh, let's tax the corporations, let's let's tax those big businesses. And I get that. It's it's not personal. It kind of it's somebody else. It's not me. But guess where that tax uh, um, burden falls? Every time the, a, a business has to pay taxes, instead of investing into their business, they can't pay it as, as high wages as they would like to. They can't expand and hire more people. They can't develop new products. Uh, it really has a dampening impact on a business's ability to, to thrive and prosper and, and be part of a, a strong, healthy community. And so we really have to look hard at the implications of where um, uh, when we raise money to pay for these pie in the sky things, our wish list of progressive ideas, what's the long-term impact gonna be to our, not only our, our economy, but to our communities around the country? Ladies and gentlemen watching, you're listening with Congressman Newhouse from the great state of Washington and Jocelyn from our Americans for Prosperity Federal Affairs and Policy Team in Capitol Hill. Um, just know that your voice at this key time on a bill like this tax and spend bill is so important. You can click on the I Volunteer link. It's right there in your Facebook feed. Just take a moment, click on that link right now, if you would. It'll take about a minute, minute and 15 seconds of your time. But what it will do is important. It will let your voice be heard to your individual member of the House of Representatives and to both of your United States senators, telling them no more of this out of control, wasteful spending and very extreme partisan wish list. And now these new tax increases. Make your voice heard. I know you may be thinking, well, gosh, my member of Congress, I'm sure uh, he or she is going to do the right thing. They don't need to hear from me. In fact, they need to know that folks back home have their back, that they're encouraging them. Or you may be thinking, well, you know, my member is, is very much liberal. They're probably going to vote for this stuff. It won't matter. I used to work on Capitol Hill many years ago. Jocelyn will tell you this as well. Every member of the House and Senate keeps track of the number of people contacting them from their district or their office, what issues they've contacted them on, and then are they for them or against them. They want to understand the pulse in their district. And we want to make sure, with your help, that right now as they're considering this tax and spend uh, horrific bill from Pelosi and the president, that they realize people are paying attention back home. So click that I volunteer li uh, link, make your voice heard. And, and Congressman, I, I want to ask you about that. Um, I worked on the Hill many years ago, uh, but I know that members did track those numbers. And can you talk for a moment about the difference it makes when some of your constituents reach out to you or when they reach out to their own members across the country, the impact that makes on Capitol Hill with you and your colleagues? So uh, in the House of Representatives particularly, and I'm sure it's too true to some extent in the Senate as well, uh, we are the voice of the people that uh, we represent. And it's key, uh, one of the key functions of, of my office is exactly what you're saying, Tim, to keep track of the kind of input we get from, from the people back home. We, we all represent uh, our own unique congressional district. We have um, very uh, diverse voices in all of our districts. And so uh, we have to, it's almost scientific the way that we keep track of things. In fact, just this morning, my staff showed me a pie chart of the different kinds of the way we're contracted, some of the issues that are being, um, uh, uh, ex opinions are being expressed. So uh, to say that we pay attention is would almost be an understatement. We we absolutely do, and uh, it does make a difference. Thank you for pointing that out, that people truly can have an impact on the outcome of some of these very, very important votes for our country. And just, just another thing that, that you, I'm sure you've talked to, to your membership about. Currently, the House of Representatives, the Democrats have a five vote margin. And there are a lot of, of, of my colleagues on, on the Democrat side of the aisle that come from districts that are not nearly as progressive or liberal as as Speaker Pelosi and many of the uh, many of the members of the Democratic Conference, uh, it will be very difficult for them, especially after hearing from their constituents, like you just pointed out, is very very important uh, to vote yes for some of this progressive liberal uh, wish list legislation. 
So I would encourage people, please don't give up. Even if they have a D behind their name, let them know what you think. I think it's, it's essential. None of us, because all the things we just talked about, the future of our country depends on some of the fiscal restraint we can show right now. None of us can afford to sit on the sidelines. We have to be active. We have to be engaged. And I appreciate you uh, uh, conveying that message to the American people. Yes, absolutely, Congressman. I think you know the American people want uh, to get back to work safely for schools to reopen. Uh, they want government to get out of the way. Uh, my mom is a small business owner in Richmond, Virginia and a, a legal immigrant from Central America. Uh, she would not like uh, to, to have further barriers to finally reopening her business and getting back to a sense of normalcy. And so even on the issue of healthcare, we see these ideas of government takeover of healthcare. When people don't want to blow up the system, they want more choices. Uh, and this is shown in, in surveys and polls. So uh, it is concerning that the things that we're prioritizing right now um, are not necessarily good policy. But they're also things that the American people don't want. And so I would like to, to pick your brain, particularly coming off of you know, the last somewhat bleak jobs report that felt very short of predictions in addition to high inflation, which we discussed, what are the policies that we should be pursuing instead? Uh, not only you know, as we look at a, a regular budgetary process that's about to kickstart, but also our need to recover from an unprecedented, or unprecedented health and economic uh, crisis. Well, you're absolutely right, Jocelyn. The, 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 the recent jobs report could only be described as absolutely abysmal. Uh, the, the jobs available versus the number of jobs that were actually filled. Uh, the, the, the gulf between those two numbers is, is huge. Um, and and I think we can point to many of this current administration's policy decisions that have brought us to this point. I don't think it's um, uh, unusual all over the country. I've, I've talked to not only members of Congress, but businesses, business owners uh, all over the country in my district in particular, and there's one common thing, theme, they cannot find enough people to hire. There are jobs open, they need to fill these positions. You know, we're talking about restaurants or retail stores, service industry uh, uh, places, farms particularly, people just are not searching for work right now. And why is that? Coming out of, of, of the, the pandemic, You'd think people would be tired of stick, stay, staying at home and not working, but, but there's something driving that. Extended unemployment benefits and, and, and incentives were actually paying people not to work. Uh, I'm, uh, and, and that's just backwards. I think that you know, for a time when jobs were not available in the height of the pandemic, we couldn't, people couldn't go to work through no fault of their own. And I thought, I thought, and many of us here in DC thought, well, this was a good response, a, a responsible action to take to help people over the, the, some of those difficult months. But, but we're past that now. Employers, businesses are screaming for uh, people to hire. Uh, they're in, offering incentives just to come interview. We'll pay you to, just to come in and, and interview for a position. Uh, and still many, many jobs are, are going unfilled. I'm proud to say that in at least, I think the last count I'm aware of, at least 22 states have decided to uh, reverse those unemployment benefit extensions. And, and, and some of them are actually, instead of paying people to stay home, rewarding people for finding a job, which I think was a very creative way. Montana, I think, was the first state to start that. And, uh, and I think that, that that showed a lot of imagination and creativity on the part of the state of Montana and others are following suit. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to, don't, don't, don't encourage or incentivize people not to work. That's not what our economy is built on. That's not how we're gonna get out of this economic slump that we are in as a country. You know, we should be growing at a very, very high rate. And we're not gonna do that if we continue to just pay people not to work. And so um, it's a dire situation. It really is. I, like I said, I know from firsthand experience on our business at home, I farm and it's very difficult to find enough employees, but every single business I talk to in town and communities throughout, throughout my district is facing the same, same thing. So um, 
that's got to change or else we will not get out of this economic slump we're in. Congressman Dan Newhouse from the great state of Washington, thank you, sir, for your leadership in Washington, D.C., uh, and for, for fighting the good fight here as such an important uh, moment for our nation. And I would urge you folks watching, if you would, click that I volunteer link. If you would, make your voice heard. Um, make sure that your House member and your two senators know that you want them to vote no on all of this deficit spending and job killing programs that are just pouring out of Washington that don't really help people. They just serve special interest. And that's not what Washington, D.C. ought to be doing uh, any of the time, but especially at this moment as we're trying to push through this pandemic. Jocelyn, thanks for what you do on our team on Capitol Hill on the policy front. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being activists and thank you uh, for loving this country uh, and standing up at a key moment. Good afternoon, everyone.